Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our Global Conversations here at Georgia State with Dr. Karen Wildwin. Your moderators for this evening will be Dr. Peggy Albers, Professor of Language and Literacy at Georgia State University, and myself, David Brown, a third year doctoral student here at Georgia State University. Global Conversations in Literacy Research are online interactive web seminars with an intent to circulate cutting edge research in the fields of literacy and language arts. For more information on our seminars, you can visit our website to find out about upcoming events, including the series for 2011-2012. You can also retrieve information about our presenters there. For anyone interested in presenting a web seminar, please contact Dr. Peggy Albers at the email address you see here. Here you see an interactive map in which we can see where the participants in this global conversation are listening from. If you would use your wine feature, which is located just west of Alaska on the map and above the red star, to indicate where you are listening from at this time. It looks as if we have participants from all over, and we want to say a special thank you for joining us. If you have any questions or comments about the presentation, please type the comments into the chat area, and Dr. Albers and I will monitor these as best as we can throughout the presentation. At the end of the presentation, Dr. Woolwind will have an opportunity to, to address these. Dr. Woolwind is an assistant professor in literacy, culture, and language education at Indiana University. She is the author of numerous articles published in international research journals on literacy and early childhood. These articles provide a critical perspective on children's play in literacy, popular media, toys, gender, and identity. Her ongoing work in new research methodologies develops innovative methods for analyzing talk, activity, and media and digital environments. Her recently released book entitled Playing Their Way into Literacies, Reading, Writing, and Belonging in the Early Childhood Classroom reframes the concept of play viewing as a literacy practice along with reading, writing, and design. I had the privilege of meeting and attending Dr. Woolwin's presentation this past November at the NCTE convention in Chicago. So I know you're going to enjoy her presentation and gain more knowledge about children and their literate life tonight. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Karen Woolwind and her presentation entitled, Constructing the Child at Play from the Schooled Child to Techno Toddlers and Back Again. Let's give her a virtual round of applause. Please use the hand use near the, the hand smiley faces. The smiley faces. Thanks, everyone. Um, I also want to thank Peggy and David for um, all that they've done to make this uh, possible tonight. It's amazing the amount of energy and time that they put into this to make these work for us. So I'm really grateful and thankful for that. Um, you'll see on the, on the first screen that I have an interact screen. And I'm hoping that we can make this more than a one-way lecture tonight. And so you've just had a, the experience of using your wand to tap um, on the map to um, locate yourself tonight. But I also have several slides as we go along that I'm going to pause and ask you to sort of vote on the discourses that you see in the data. So I'd like to kind of have this become a way in which you can also analyze along with me. And I'll share the tools that I'm using. Um, there's also a way to interact using the chat box. I have an arrow pointing down. And if you haven't um, chatted yet tonight, it might be a good opportunity just to uh, try it out. Um, you can chat to this room, or you can chat um, privately to other participants that, participants that you see. Um, and then we have sort of a grand experiment that we're trying with Twitter. Um, if you are on Twitter and can open another browser so that you could 
follow the hashtag along with our conversation tonight. We would love to have tweets go out on the hashtag GCLR and allow that um, allow people to join in that way. Um, and then finally, there is a way to raise your hand. Um, and you'll see there's a little blue hand just below the participant list. And um, I think if you raise your hand, then um, Peggy will call on you. I'm not exactly sure how she does that, but the moderators will make sure that you get a chance to chat. OK. So then um, we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, I'm looking back now 100 years to 1912 and to think about how we're constructing our visions of what childhood um, means to us. And so um, in 1912, a Triangle Waste Factory fire um, in 1911 um, actually killed 140 women and children. And it was one of the events that sparked the rise of concern to uh, uh, enact child labor legislation to protect children. Um, so um, this, these beginnings um, invoke discourses of child innocence and vulnerability. And you can see from this picture of a child working in the mills that um, they were working in extremely dangerous conditions. But this legislation institution institutionalized the period we now know as childhood in that children could no longer be seen as just part of the workforce. Um, and so they were pulled out of factories and, and um, sweatshops and out of mills and put into schools. So this became sort of a mandated space where children would spend childhood. And this became um, the child's work, going to school. But along with that, there was quite um, a lot of concern that children should be connected to nature. This was something that they were not getting when they were in the factory settings. And so um, the idea that children needed to be close to nature, that it fulfilled something within them, was very strong with this as well. And so now we have, a, today, we've moved ahead, 2012, we have the techno-toddler. And instead of being connected to nature, children should be connected. So I'm going to show a series of, of videos tonight. And um, you'll see that on each video, there's also um, a way that you can uh, access the YouTube screen as well if it's not working for you from here. And so I'm going to let um, Peggy go ahead and show the first video for us. I'm coming to time out because apparently riding the dog like it's a small horse is frowned upon in this establishment. Luckily though, I, you know, I can conceal this bad boy underneath my blanket just so I can get on E-Trade, check my investment portfolio, research stocks, and set conditional orders. Wait, what, why is he? Oh, I see. Hey, Mac, would it kill you to throw a guy a warning mark? Huh? You know I wanted a bird. E-Trade, invested unleashed. So you can see that in numerous ways the the idea of the techno ch um, okay I was I'm sorry I just saw a note pop up to me on <laughs> the screen um, you can see in various ways that the techno toddler is sort of this construction of this very um, savvy young child who has a facile understanding of how technology works uh, often beyond what children what adults have. Um, by comparing these two ideas, the school child and the techno toddler, we can unpack them and see how the ways that we construct the young child at play reflect and shape our beliefs about literacy in childhood. And I'm also asking, how are these constructions complicated by the overlapping discourses that we see in online space? And of course, online space is much more complex and has further dimensions. So we'll look at those tonight. Um, I'm sharing tonight some uh, excerpts from a corpus of data that I've, that I've gathered. Um, I actually have this on a blog. It's called earlyadoptersplay.blogspot.com. Um, and over the course of two years, I began um, collecting instances of YouTube videos where parents or family members, or sometimes in this, as we just saw, commercials, you know, depict young children with technology. And um, 
you can find these for yourselves simply by just you know googling for iPad baby or something like that. There are thousands of these on the internet. And I started looking across these um, to see what kinds of patterns I could see um, in these videos. And it suggested to me that families are placing a high value on children's abilities to use technology meaningfully and also with a certain degree of independence. So when I'm looking at these specifically, you know, how do I know that these are significant? Um, and so here are some examples. The, just the, by virtue of the action of capturing, uploading, and sharing children's technology interactions, that seems to indicate people are finding these significant in some way. But also explicitly, you can see the significance in um, the video descriptions that to summarize uh, the video that the producers post along with the video. And then within the videos themselves, there are often subtitles or parent or family narration that goes along describing what the children are doing. Um, and so those are producer kinds of indicators of significance. But the viewers as well are showing that they find these significant. And by virtue of the number of viewings that these videos draw, and then the content of the viewer's uh, comments that we can find within the bottom of the page on YouTube. So I'm interpreting all of this data through the lenses of nexus of practice. And I'm drawing on Scullin's work. Um, in nexus of practice, it's somewhat like Bourdieu's concept of habitus, in that the most significant and ingrained practices run in the background where we don't even notice them. And this is where it circulates what we as a community expect, what, a what actions um, do we use to automatically recognize each other, what marks you as an insider within this group. And then for novices, we often show these particular um, practices that we value. We make them really explicit for young children so that they can begin to prepa um, be prepared to participate in our, our culture. So the question I'm asking tonight is, what literacies do these novices um, need in order to learn to participate in digital cultures? Um, we can look at this two ways. And the reason it's important for literacy is because the tool, these tools that are um, online children are using to mediate the world. So we can look at the ways in which they use online tools, the iPad, uh, in the E-Trade video, for example, as a way with things, as something that the child's using to interact. And I'm using cultural historical activity theory to explain that. Tonight I'm just giving a sort of a sampler of the kinds of things I'm doing in, in terms of um, theory and methods and so that we can get right into the, um, the videos. Uh, and the other theory that, that is combined in the idea of nexus of practice is the idea that we are uh, using social practices when we're interacting with technology. And so it's demonstrating our embodied habitus, those sort of, those sort of memorized bodily ways of doing things that, that we just um, sort of, in quotes, naturally take up. Um, so when we're examining nexus of practice, we're looking at the mediated actions. That means those embodied gestures or action-oriented ways of operating literacies um, with new media. So for example, on an iPad, you're looking at how fingers are moving, what's happening on the touch screen. And iPads are particularly useful in early child be childhood because there's that immediate response. So never before have we had such um, powerful technology that seems custom made for young, young children to use. So with nexus, a nexus analysis approach, I'm looking to see um, how action-oriented and multimodal ways of interacting um, happen. But I'm also looking to see what are the histories and what are the likely futures of these actions? How do things overlap? And what are the emanations? And you're going to see that in a model I have coming up. Um, but it said more simply, we're really looking at who's doing what with discourse. So we'll look critically at this. So in the very first um, video, you might look to see what do you think the mediated actions are? What are the ways of handling that this techno-toddler 
is picking up as she learns to play Angry Birds. Sorry, I forgot to turn my mic on. Um, so she exactly she exactly knows where to click and how to move things and how she can um, make that Angry Bird launch. So if we think about who's doing what with this course in this YouTube video of a toddler playing Angry Birds, we might think about with whom for what purpose. So there's something social about that. Who's helping her? How is it happening? And what's the purpose of showing that? What's the purpose of her playing with it? And then which ways of doing things matter here? So thinking about her, her historical body, what are the ways of her handling materials and tools that matter? And then finally, what's discourse doing here? We use discourse to justify these things, or to question these things, or to um, pose make them problematic. So um, we're looking at, dis at the discourses that are operating in this space. Scotland puts these, these three things together then to say when all in any instance we can look at in, you know, in the world, you can see all of these things happening. So walking down a shopping mall, you can see that there's an interaction order of you know you as a single person walking through the mall, you know looking at all the discourses uh, that are around you. You have particular ways of of navigating and moving in the in the mall. That is you in a one particular space. But when we move this to the online space, I'm arguing that we have a convergence here of you know where is she located? Is she on the kitchen table in her family's kitchen? Is she on the screen in my, you know, den? Is she in your living room? You know, where is she? And so we have all of these multiple things that come together. And so that's what we're going to unpack um, right now. So and to do that, I'm going to take these one at a time, looking closely at um, each of the three parts and with video examples. So we have the interaction order. So this builds on Goffman's um, soci sociological theory of interaction. And he has um, singles with platform events. And to that, I've added affinity spaces. So if we look at this uh, little toddler playing Angry Birds as a, as a single, you know, the film constructs her as an independent computer user working alone. But there's a with going on. She's doing this for a parent, with a parent, parents holding the camera. So this, it's people cooperating. But it's also a platform event, a spectacle for the entertainment of distant viewers like us. And it's actually being played for others. And then there's an affinity space. So the, by virtue of posting this on YouTube, it takes another twist. And so here, it's open for fans and viewers and critics where we're making meaning together and we're co-producing. And it brings in the, uh, the notion of critique that goes along with this. And you'll see some of that as well. Um, there's When children, um, if we look just really closely just at a, one of these for right now for tonight as an example, we can say, let's take the with. Let's take the parent and child acting together. Um, there's implicit teaching that the parent's doing, that the child's observing all day long as they see the parent engaging in techno literacies like operating the iPad. And then there's explicit teaching through parent coaching. And through these two kinds of teaching um, that happen with children and technology, novices learn, here's how to do this, but also, here's what we value. And there's also a belief there, you can do it too. So you know, you can, if you're familiar with Brian Camborn's theories, you can, you can kind of map that onto the expectation portion um, of his work. So here's an example of a with 
happening with the parent where there's explicit teaching going on. So there's a lot of joy there but as the parents are um, you know, helping the child to understand how to play and maneuver the keys on the piano. So we'll go to the next part of, of that uh, nexus. So we'll look at historical bodies. So what are the practices that children are learning to take up that become automatic things that they know just how to do that's without really seeming to have too much um, instruction? So historical bodies are the idea that bodies are acting with materials. And so the simplest physical mediated actions, in this case, the tapping on a screen, gets interpreted as a social practice here as playing the piano. Um, it's those little finger actions all get interpreted by parents as that's intentional piano playing. Um, the, nexus of the nexus of practice materialize discursive expectations for particular identities. So, oh, he's, look, look, look at him, look at that, look at how he's sitting up. You know, all of those things that the parents are constructing around the child's interaction with technology. But uh, this also means something for us in school. So, in, um, Ellen Luke's written about the ways in which bodies are inscribed with certain practices. So, the school child learns that writing is, means sitting still and holding, the prop, with, holding a pencil with the proper grip feet on the floor, erect posture in a chair. And the school teacher learns that you must intervene to correct errors so children learn the right habits, that they learn to reposition children's fingers to their proper grip. All of this in order to retrain bodies in ter to inscribe institutional control. So not so much about the writing, but as the compliance with the institutional expectation. Contrast that with the digital child that we look, that we were just watching. The child learns to sweep, to swipe, sorry, the finger across the screen to search and scroll, to pinch, to make something smaller, or sweep it to make it larger, to tap, to select. There's the expectation that one finger is all you need to be able to write. And then an expectation that tools will respond to touch. I don't know how many of you have had this experience recently, but I'm becoming so attuned to tapping on iPads that when I'm in a store, I'll be tapping on the screen first, and then I'll look down and see, oh, there's a keyboard. Um, the digital teacher learns that we must moderate technology through everyday use. Um, we model technology, but we also need to, to make connections so children can actually participate in these literacies on global networks. So finally, discourses. And tonight, um, I want us to think about what discourses are doing. Um, discourse always accomplishes something. So it constructs identities, activities, worlds, or meanings. The discourses that we live in are all around us, and they circulate globally. But when they're taken up locally, um, there are also always multiple overlapping discourses in any one place, and we're going to look at that tonight. So we can ask the question, what's discourse doing here? There's a foregrounding that discourse does and then a backgrounding, according to Scullin's work. So um, in this war relief Red Cross poster, it's foregrounded. It's foregrounding the idea that we need to protect this innocent child. But at the same time, it's mobilizing our political support on one particular side of a war. What's discourse doing here? So here we have the two functions. The background, the foregrounded picture shows us that we have obviously a vulnerable, innocent, so vulnerable that she's naked, even though she has her Mary Janes and anklets on, all to make us feel a particular emotion and to buy into a particular discourse. So defending the vulnerable is the foregrounded message. But the backgrounded piece, the political work that's happening here, is justifying nationalism. So I'm going to give you a chance to do some, tweet, some tweeting or chatting. We'll just take a, a minute here to have you share what you think 
What's discourse doing here? What's foregrounded? What's backgrounded? What's happening with race? Nice. Faceless adults? Exactly. Oh, I like that, that, that we're at the same level as the child and everyone else is above us, so there's an empathy that's built there through this picture. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Erin. So, um, I think it's really, it's really powerful how an image does all of this, right? Um, and that's what I think a big part of what we need to, to think about is how these things are things that we just seem to know um, and that are so visible. I'm also, I'm also thinking when I'm looking at this picture, the work that we place on young children to be on the forefront of this social change. And, it, it, and, and what a powerful um, image the innocent child is. I don't know if you notice, but when there's a crisis in the world on CNN, I always listen to see how soon it goes to, and we need to teach the children not to fill in the blank. Whatever the, the, pot, or whatever the problem is, it becomes a mat, quickly becomes a matter of protecting the children or teaching the children something. Okay, so you get the idea of the point of all of these discourses. So I'm going to now take us through four discourses that I, th that I think are at play um, when we're thinking about the digital child or the, um, or the school child. And that is the innocent, the developing organism, the digital native, and the apprentice. I'm going to go very quickly because I want us to have time at the end to um, analyze some of these together. This draws on work from childhood studies overall, all of these discourses that I'm going to present, and as well as the sociology of childhood. Okay, so the idea that the, of the innocent comes from a very old idea by Rousseau and Emile in which the child needs to be interacting with nature and um, we see that even today in the idea that there is a nature deficit order, that if children are not close to nature, something fundamentally is um, taken away from them. On the flip side of this, we have the mistrust of technology as time away from nature. So it's a zero-sum game, either or. So if we think, what's discourse doing here? Well, it, it makes us, um, the innocent child makes us want to monitor them so that we, they, we keep them away from that that is in, inappropriate for them. But it also disciplines adults and by creating a role of a monitor and then adults are monitored as to how well they're doing this. We'll go to the developing organism. The developing organism has its roots in biology. So we understand the child through this discourse as a psychomedical biological organism on a particular developmental path that's predictable and universal. So this sets up pathways and it also sets up optimal windows and timelines. At the same time we can say what's discourse doing here? It's producing a difference. If you're on the timeline in an expected way, you're normal. If you're not, you fall into an abnormal range. It creates delays and the need for intervention it also cre creates the possibilities of precociousness and head starts. And you see that in the raft of materials that are on the market to help accelerate development. So um, we can look a little more closely and we can look at ourselves and say, well, discourse constructs us in the field of early childhood education as experts. Um, you saw this also in the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, press release on warnings against too much television and screen time. 
Um, we look to the we look to the development and what might hinder development as a way of justifying a range of activities. And so in this um, report that came up from the AAP, there was a concern about the decrease in parent-child talk time and secondhand media exposure, which brings which connotes with radiation, right? So the concerns in this were not medical. If you read the report, they were concerned about educational development for children. Okay. Moving to the apprentice, we have childhood as a period of preparation, schooling is of the apprent the proper apprenticeship and work of children. It's the child's job. And in this view, it's a focus on the individual. So it, this, what's discourse doing here? It's individuating. We ha are expecting an internalized mastery of standardized content. We're producing a product here. And we want this child to be skillful in these products. It is a national mission. So it's also supporting sort of the idea of nationalism. And of course, in G's new capital um, work order, the new worker is an information worker and and beyond. So you know, children should be working on digital projects, but with particular tasks in mind. Which leads us to the digital native, which is the fourth discourse. And the digital navy, native is part of Gen Z. They're connected 24-7. Their first language is text. They are othered, but importantly, um, this othering makes them more empowered than adults who are constructed as digital immigrants. So what comes natural to the digital native is difficult for the adult. So there are numerous uh, studies going on um, by, this is by the Kaiser Foundation, 0 to 6. This is one by the Nielsen Ratings on children's um, internet and YouTube viewing use, but that show that children are very immersed in digital um, cultures. OK, finally, this, so we come back to this convergence idea. So we have uh, these four discourses that are circling around. We have the multiple kinds of interaction orders. And then we have this historical body of the child that's taking up all of these new digital practices. So I'm going to ask you now to view this video. And, uh, and um, I'll share some of the comments that the that were in on the YouTube site. And then I'll have you make some decisions about what of those four discourses that we just looked at do you see present in this video on the iPad versus a magazine? What do you notice? So uh, Pig, if you'd play this one, that'd be great. So I love it when she's um, trying out her finger to make sure it's still working. OK, so I think I have a question, right? I think we do, Karen. I think we do, Let's Karen. Just check with okay. check with Audra.
Audra, do you have a question you'd like to ask Dr. Woolwin at this moment? It looks like she's going to type her question, Dr. Woolwin, if you want to go ahead and carry on. Her question is, what to make of APA with no screen time for kids under two? Um, do you want to respond to that at all? Yeah, I, um, actually, I have that in a later screen at the end. I want to talk a little bit more about that exact uh, press release and how, that's, how that might be taken up after we look through some of the discourses. So if we don't mind, can I push that to a little bit later? That's great, Karen. That's Thanks great, very Karen. much. Thank okay. Much. Okay. So um, this techno toddler video went viral. It had over three million views, and interestingly, um, very split on likes and dislikes. So if we look at a few of the comments, the first was, "You let Steve Jobs grow. Steve Jobs grow your daughter. What's wrong with you?" And baby's a baby. Way to be an awful parent. Print-based media hasn't died just yet. Your one-year-old daughter is so adorable, and I hate how people are posting nasty comments. She's only one. Geez, she's just learning how to use her finger. And then finally, why are you guys mad? Boy, look at gestures in her hands, how she tried to poke her leg to see if her finger was working. This is pretty cool. So I'm going to ask people to take their wand tools on the side and just click on the various, th um, the various things that, the various discourses that you see happening. And there should be um, the chance to, to move around and click more than one. Hopefully, it'll look like fireworks over here. So fascinating. I would love to have to look how look how spread. We have these. It's so interesting. There's so many things happening um, and overlapping in such interesting ways. I think um, let's go to a few more. Maybe at the end we'll have people can refer back and and we can have some more comments and, and chat about this. But I'll show you what um, what I came up with my with my research. So when looking at this and and through my analysis, I could see this overlap of, as you did, many different things overlapping, developing organism, digital native, the innocent child. Um, in her historical body, I think this is such a good example of the finger sweeping is already ingrained for her as a way of handling image and navigating text. And then there's an interaction order here of the parent filming, and it creates a whiff for a platform event, but it's filmed as a single, as if she's doing this on her own. Um, the viewer response, what? You let Steve Jobs grow your daughter, creates this infinitive space so everyone is um, on board doing this together. OK, next video. This may be one that's familiar to you. Ran a few years back, I think in 2009, in the P I'm a PC series. And so we'll watch this one and do the same thing. My name's Kylie. I took a picture of my sister. Here and I think your mic is off there. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, there are 177,000 views, many more likes and dislikes, which isn't surprising because it's commercially produced. Um, and the comments are, oh my god, she's four and she's going to send it to her mom and dad. What? Does she live alone? And then the answer, she prob she's probably home alone at any rate. She can certainly uh, control the PC more skillfully than my parents combined. So of those discourses, what, do you, what are you thinking? One tool's out and 
lots for the digital native. And I agree, and I, it's, that's kind of how I see it too, the, on the apprenticeship as well, because she's definitely doing some tasks there. OK, I'm going to move it on. Thank you for your help. OK, so um, that's exactly what I was seeing, digital native and competent apprentice combined. And in this constructed interaction order, remember we're watching a video, and so we have no way of knowing if it was a, you know, a, a already a professional film crew there or whatever. But she's constructed as independently self-sufficient, more skilled than adults. Um, and in her historical body, we see her connecting cables, the mouse, the cursor. Um, she's doing it with speed. And that's another piece of this nexus of practice, that you have to be able to do things so quickly and on an automatic level to pull off a skillful identity. OK. And so this is our um, final video. It's from the app Smack Talk, in which you can record your own voice and have it played back through various animals. So we'll watch this one. And I'll turn off my mic now. OK, you want to turn your mic back on, Karen. Thank you. <laughs> so um, in November, when I put this slide together, there were 517 total views. Tonight, there were 1,700, so it's more than tripled. 100% likes. You know, the, People love this video. Um, and the comments were, she knows how to use the iPad better than me, laugh out loud. Ah, uh, no, and then, you know, and then big laughing emoticons. So what are you seeing here? Magic wands, please. OK, in my research, I looked at um, I, the innocent child in this versus the digital native and the apprentice. So, you know, she's learning to operate all of these things. She's learning how to um, to interact. We think with this new technology, but then it raises some interesting questions. So, is she interacting? You know, she's using the she's using the tool, to, but is she talking? Or is she just is she talking to herself? What's really happening? It's not clear. So this actually, I think, is another interesting convergence with technology. Um, and then we have, you know, bringing me back to the um, American Academy of Pedi Pediatrics um, have this prohibition against watching too much screen time in for toddlers. So what's the opportunity cost to very young children who don't have access to this kind of everyday interaction or non-interaction with technology? What are they missing out on? And then what constitutes meaning? Is this a meaningful exchange? Um, it depends on if we think that reading would only be the lyrics. You know, of language rather than the mu what I call the music of language. There's certainly a rhythm that she's picking up, and she, even though it seems like she's just doing gibberish, she does have that sort of interaction pattern and pausing that we would expect um, children to be developing in their syntax. And then, what's technology doing here? Is it a toy or a tool? So I don't have answers to these questions, but I think they're really fascinating to think about. 
So um, in closing here, I just want to bring this back to the school child. And I want to think about um, early childhood education. And we are in the model from 1911 as preparing for school. So early childhood is preparing for school. And tests are pushed down into preschool. We still have an idea that knowledge is individual, internalized, not participation in digital networks, that we need to monitor and protect this, the young children. And then we get blocked sites and filters in our schools where children cannot reach out and, and connect with um, other communities. And we get very little technology in early childhood classrooms. Or if we have it, it's with a very training kind of rote focus. My argument is that the very youngest children deserve the very best technology. And now it's so widely available, we are out of reasons not to, to give it to them. Um, and so a lot of our arguments to maintain um, the status quo fall back on these ideas of the child as innocent or the child as a developing organism. And you know the, the screens might somehow have radiation um, and s things that just seem very hollow. So I want to come back to Audra had a question about the, um, the pediatrics uh, study that came out that actually that discouraged children from watching large amounts of television or spending time in front of screens. And so what happened was that when that came to the, um, it was really more about the baby Einstein and the kind of video, um, the video, uh, I guess, immersion that happens, you know, my ba your baby can read and that kind of thing. And, and they wrote, children should be playing and not looking at screens. But what happens in our media world is that sound bite then becomes taken up and it becomes used, people use it to generate all kinds of back to nature, developing organism, innocent child kind of discourse um, arguments. And um, I think we should be thinking about how does this affect low-income households where TV screens are the primary source of technology, as opposed to more affluent households where children are 24-7 you know, connected to the internet. Um, so the anti-screen soundbite is likely to expand to all early childhood um, as it merges with developing organism and infant child discourses. And I guess my, the big takeaway from this that I'd like to have us think about is that um, we should be looking carefully to see what discourse is doing here and how are our decisions um, and the things that we're recommending for young children based on these impressions of school children or impressions of techno toddlers. And maybe we can begin to see past that a bit. And I would like to just have, give people a chance to have some um, time for questions. So we'll just stop right there and see what people have to say. If you'd like to ask Karen a question, uh, please raise your hand. There's a little green hand right underneath the participants with a little green arrow. You can certainly ask it live. Or if you have a question, please type it in the chat area, and Karen will address it. Thanks very much. Karen, we had a question earlier in the chat area. And the participant really wanted to hear you talk a little bit about how are discourse, analy how are discourse analysis, how are they working against play? It seems that in this particular participant's school, there is, it's a full day kindergarten class. And there's just a sad lack of play. Do you want to talk about that at all? Yeah, I think um, you know we're seeing this. We're seeing this everywhere. Um, it's for at least I think the last five years it's been dwindling in kindergarten, and now I think it's even stretching down um, into preschools where play is just n not able to stand up to sort of these other accountability discourses that we have in schools. And what's interesting, I think, if, you know, kind of keeping it with the idea of technology in young children, um, you know, we might think that 
in order to prepare children for a digital workforce later on that we would be interested in giving them really great early experiences with technology and with play. But instead what I think um, we have this idea that well, we need to prepare them to do these paper and pencil tests and so we throw everything else out in order to make time for that. And by we I meant, I probably mean policymakers. Um, I, I don't. I think teachers are still scrambling to try to find ways in which to keep playing classrooms, and it becomes extremely hard to do that. But I've written several articles with that premise: um, dilemmas and discourses of learning to write, and, and um, other things. It's sort of the central argument I always make uh, is trying to find ways to bring play into, back into classrooms. And I think it's a, a social justice um, issue as well because I think it allows children to bring what they know into school where they can, um, in order to be more successful. So um, anyway. OK, we have another question um, that asks, what about the effects of screen time on brain development? And how might this affect ease of learning to read? And another follow-up question, what is, what is your opinion of toddler screen time? I turned your mic off, Karen. Now you can turn it on again. Sorry, it bumps me off, and then I forget to, to flip it on. I think for a really well-reasoned response to screen time, you can look at the Joan Cooney Gans Joan Gans Cooney Center. Um, they have some some great um, white papers on this kind of thing. But um, the effects of screen time on children, I think. Um, I, you know, I, I read through the pediatrics journal article, and there was very little in it about screens, uh, screens and brain development and that kind of thing. It was much more about talk interaction and the fact that children were gazing at TVs and not gazing at parents' faces. Um, and I'm not sure that gaze. Which are, if you're tr if you're moving from a verbal environment to an image-based environment, that I don't think it's unreasonable to expect that gaze might shift. So I don't think that some of our ways of measuring these things are um, always totally in sync with the ways we're thinking about new literacies. It's definitely a time of transition. So I, I have sort of a very open mind about that. And does that answer the other question? Oh, I think so. I think That's so. good. That's Thanks, good. Karen. I'm turning your mic off just momentarily, and then you can turn it back on. Huli, Huli Hong has a question. I'm wondering what kind of possible literacy or other kind of learning may occur when my three-year-old plays Angry Bird on my iPhone. Right. I think, um, you know, I think definitely there's a lot of training of the historical body there that we looked at before. You know, the, if we're seeing that um, children who are very adept at understanding what a swipe is as and what a um, you know what a pinch means with their fingers on, on a screen are are learning more than those specific tools. They're also learning a flexibility because it's likely that Angry Birds and other games sort of morph from screen to screen that you need to use something different. Um, you need to use different hand motions for different games, for different screens, and those things change over time. So they're also, I think, learning a very flexible use and a flexibility of that kind of digital literacy that has yet, I don't think we yet have a good understanding of what that means for them, but um, you know, I think a flexible approach to those literacies will be good. That's my prediction. It's not. It's that's totally an opinion at this point. I think that's I actually, think that's the actually we're, the we're out of time, out of Karen. Time. So we're going to go ahead and conclude this presentation. Uh, I'm going to let um, my other our doctoral student host take over now, David. We want to thank Dr. Woolwin for our presentation this evening. 
Her research and perspectives into the literate lives of these techno toddlers have given us a great deal to think about and have certainly informed and strengthened my own understanding of literacy education. So please join us again in thanking Dr. Woodwin with a virtual round of applause for her wonderful presentation. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our global conversations here at Georgia State with Dr. Karen Woodwin. Your moderators for this evening will be Dr. Peggy Albers, Professor of Language and Literacy at Georgia State University, and myself, David Brown, a third year doctoral student here at Georgia State University. Global Conversations in Literacy Research are online interactive web seminars with an intent to circulate cutting edge research in the fields of literacy and language arts. For more information on our seminars, you can visit our website to find out about upcoming events, including the series for 2011-2012. You can also retrieve information about our presenters there. For anyone interested in presenting a web seminar, please contact Dr. Peggy Albers at the email address you see here. Here you see an interactive map in which we can see where the participants in this global conversation are listening from. If you would use your wine feature, which is located just west of Alaska on the map and above the red star, to indicate where you are listening from at this time. It looks as if we have participants from all over, and we want to say a special thank you for joining us. If you have any questions or comments about the presentation below the participant list, and um, I think if you raise your hand, then um, Peggy will call on you. I'm not exactly sure how she does that, but the moderators will make sure that you get a chance to chat. OK. So then um, we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, I'm looking back now 100 years to 1912 and to think about how we're constructing our visions of what childhood um, means to us. And so um, in 1912, a Triangle Waste factory fire um, or in 1911 um, actually killed 140 women and children. And it was one of the events that sparked the rise of concern to uh, uh, enact child labor legislation to protect children. Um, so um, this, these beginnings um, invoke discourses of child innocence and vulnerability. And you can see from this picture of a child working in the mills that um, they were working in extremely dangerous conditions. But this legislation institution, institutionalized the period we now know as childhood in that children could no longer be seen as just part of the workforce. Um, and so they were pulled out of factories and, and um, sweatshops and out of mills and put into schools. So this became sort of a mandated space where children would spend childhood. And this became um, the child's work, going to school. But along with that, there was quite um, a lot of concern that children should be connected to nature. This was something that they were not getting when they were in the factory settings. Thanks, everyone. Um, I also want to thank Peggy and David for um, all that they've done to make this uh, possible tonight. It's amazing the amount of energy and time that they put into this to make these work for us. So I'm really grateful and thankful for that. Um, you'll see on the, on the first screen that I have an interact screen. And I'm hoping that we can make this more than a one-way lecture tonight. And so you've just had a, the experience of using your wand to tap um, on the map to um, locate yourself tonight. But I also have several slides as we go along that I'm going to pause and ask you to sort of vote on the discourses that you see in the data. So I'd like to kind of have this become a way in which you can also analyze along with me. And I'll share the tools that I'm using. Um, there's also a way to interact using the chat box. So I have an arrow pointing down. And if you haven't um, chatted yet tonight, 
it might be a good opportunity just to uh, try it out. Um, you can chat to this room or you can chat um, privately to other participants that participants that you see. Um, and then we have sort of a grand experiment that we're trying with Twitter. Um, if you are on Twitter and can open another browser so that you could follow the hashtag along with our conversation tonight, we would love to have tweets go out on the hashtag GCLR and allow that um, allow people to join in that way. Um, and then finally, there is a way to raise your hand. Um, and you'll see there's a little blue hand just and so um, the idea that children needed to be close to nature, that it fulfilled something within them, was very strong with this as well. And so now we have a, today, we've moved ahead, 2012, we have the techno toddler and instead of being connected to nature, children should be connected. So I'm going to show a series of, of videos tonight and um, you'll see that on each video there's also um, a way that you can uh, access the YouTube screen as well if it's not working for you from here. And so I'm going to let uh, Peggy go ahead and show the first video for us. I'm coming to time out because apparently riding the dog like it's a small horse is frowned upon in this establishment. Luckily though, I, you know, I concealed this bad boy underneath my blanket just so I can get on E-Trade, check my investment portfolio, research stocks, and set conditional orders. Wait, what, why is he? Oh, I see. Hey, Mac, would it kill you to throw a guy a warning mark? You know I wanted a bird. E-Trade, Investing Unleashed. So you can see that in numerous ways the, the idea of the techno ch um, Okay. I was, I'm sorry, I just saw a note pop up to me on the screen. Um, you can see in various ways that the techno toddler is sort of this construction of this very um, savvy young child who has a mission. Please type the comments into the chat area and Dr. Alberts and I will monitor these as best as we can throughout the presentation. At the end of the presentation, Dr. Woolwind will have an opportunity to, to address these. Dr. Woolwind is an assistant professor in literacy, culture, and language education at Indiana University. She is the author of numerous articles published in international research journals on literacy and early childhood. These articles provide a critical perspective on children's play in literacy, popular media, toys, gender, and identity. Her ongoing work in new research methodologies develops innovative methods for analyzing talk, activity, and media in digital environments. Her recently released book entitled Playing Their Way into Literacies, Reading, Writing, and Belonging in the Early Childhood Classroom reframes the concept of play viewing as a literacy practice along with reading, writing, and design. I had the privilege of meeting and attending Dr. Woolwin's presentation this past November at the NCTE convention in Chicago. So I know you're going to enjoy her presentation and gain more knowledge about children and their literate lives tonight. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Karen Woolwind and her presentation entitled Constructing the Child at Play from the Schooled Child to Techno Toddlers and Back Again. Let's give her a virtual round of applause. Please use the Please hand use near the, the smiley, hand, faces. smiley faces. 